بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who's created, the one who nourishes, sustains, provides, protects, cures, and the one who has absolute control of every aspect of existence. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen, nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa tabi'een. Complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions without exception. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of you as well without exception. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our offspring, those to come up to the end of time. May Allah keep them all steadfast on the deen and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all ease from whatever difficulties we may be facing in our lives. I mean, my brothers and sisters in Islam, it is an honor to be here this evening in Dubai at this beautiful Al-Manar Center. I want to start off by saying each one of us goes through difficulties and hardship. We all have issues that we face, challenges, and life is never just a sail through. You have to have things Challenges, issues, problems, difficulties, sometimes disaster, calamity and so on. And these are all part of the tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make it easy for every one of us. Hope is indeed the portion of a believer. If you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will always have hope. And you will always know that there is a supreme maker who is most merciful. You and I know that we repeat Surah Al-Fatiha so many times a day. So many times in every salah, in every prayer, and you and I do know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen His qualities and names to be in that particular surah, those of mercy. So He says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Then He says, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. The beneficent, the most merciful, or the one who has a broad mercy and the one who is the owner of a specified mercy. These are the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants us to be hopeful. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter what you're going through, better days are definitely to follow. Even if your entire lifetime has been difficult, remember, better days are to follow in the hereafter. It is the mercy of Allah. The more you go through and endure here in the correct way as a believer, through what we would know as sabr or patience, you need to understand the reward of it is so great that Allah says, He will recompense those who have gone through endurance in a way that He alone knows. In one place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, without account, which means unlimited. The reward is unlimited. It's so big that you ask, what do you want for it? You know, when we get to paradise and we get to Jannah, may Allah grant us all paradise. May Allah grant us all Jannah. Ameen. When we get there, there is no limit. You can ask for what you want. You've been told that and so have I. You get whatever you want. So there is no limit to it. You cannot be told, you know, there's a ration. We're only giving five to you today. No, it's unlimited. You say what you want, it's there. So the limitations are only for this dunya and in this world. But a loser is a one who has struggled and suffered in this world, become depressed by becoming angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means they fail to engage in sabr. And then they die in a condition that they were totally away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they've lost their hereafter. We don't want that to happen to us. And for this reason, it's important for us to look at narrations that have mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifest in them, clear in them. Yes, it's also important to look at what Allah says about the warnings to those who do evil. 
It's something that we need to strike a balance. You know, your child, you commend them, you thank them, you congratulate the child when the child does well. But at the same time, you know that once in a while you need to remind them, warn them, hey, you know, if you're going to do this, perhaps something else is going to come in your direction that you don't like. Today, I'd like to think one of the most effective ways of disciplining children is just to take away a little bit of what they have in terms of technology. And I think a lot of them would come right. If you say, you go here, I take away your iPad. No, please don't. No, dad, I don't want. No, 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 I'll be okay. Now, before it used to be a little bit different. When I was young, the belt used to come out, mashallah. So times have changed. The same applies with us. Times change, but Islam doesn't change. The Quran doesn't change. The Sharia doesn't change. The system of Allah doesn't change. So when I say times change with us, I think we need more hope than anything else because it's quite depressing just reading a newspaper. It's quite depressing just looking at the news. It's quite depressing sometimes just to hear what one another have to say. It's an age of materialism where even if your salary is okay, everything is fine, you have a car. But because that car happens to have been perhaps modeled in 2000 and we're now sitting 16 years later, we're depressed. But it gets you from point A to point B. You are depressed and sad not because you don't have. You have, but you don't have what you want. You've just got what you need. That's why we become depressed. Allah's given you what you need, but perhaps He's kept away what you want from you as part of your test. So why am I starting this way, yet we're supposed to be talking about the Splendid Seven? For me, I've learned something crucial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks for any excuse to forgive you and to grant you Jannah, to grant you paradise. Give Him something, something. When you look at the doors of Jannah, it's not just one door. There are eight different doors, so many different doors and so many different deeds that will earn you Jannah. They'll get you into Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy dictates that a specific single deed can at times get you straight into paradise. If Allah loves it, that doesn't mean just do one thing. I can give you one example. You know, there's a narration which makes mention of how uh, someone entered paradise because of being compassionate towards an animal, a cat, right? So because of being compassionate towards the cat, they were told, okay, this person was in Jannah, in Jannah. So I remember meeting uh, someone who told me, you know what, I really have no hope. I don't read Salah, I'm not dressed properly, but I've kept a lot of cats. I've kept a lot of cats because I know Allah loves cats. How can you say that? You've misinterpreted the whole thing. I'm not saying Allah doesn't love or loves the cats. No. But the reality is there was compassion. Allah is showing you to be compassionate towards others. Yes, that could lead towards your paradise. It doesn't mean that you need to collect a bunch of, or you know, a whole pack of dogs, for example, because there is another narration making mention of a certain man who actually filled his a leather sock or his shoe with some water in order to quench the thirst of a dog and that deed was so loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah forgave him. It is uniquely in your life, your deeds, the moment you get to display to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that compassion. Remember this. So there are so many of these deeds. I give you another example. If it's so difficult to dress Islamically, especially for the sisters, because of what's going on across the globe, because of the environment you may be living in that may not be Islamic, because of whatever other reason, it's so difficult. So many have contemplated abandoning the hijab based on what hooligans and those who are not connected to Islam are perpetrating in the name of Islam in terms of violence and killings across the globe or in some parts of the globe. And it has a negative impact on every one of us. So some contemplate to abandon the hijab because it's become difficult to catch, for example, the public transport in certain countries, identifying yourself as a Muslim. My sister, for you, your paradise lies in remaining upright for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As difficult as it was, you said, Oh Allah, I, you, you can see how difficult it is. You know, but I'm never going to compromise something that is connected to your pleasure. That's your jannah. That to me is more important than anything else. It, because it, it's that moment that will determine what deed is of value. 
at a time when it's extremely difficult for you to do something and you do it for the sake of Allah, that is what the value is all about. For example, salah. It might be simple for you to read Salat al-Dhuhr because you work in the midst of Muslimin and everyone's praying and you just simply can't say, you know what, I'll give it a miss. You know, I remember, this is a true story, okay? There was a group of people, uh, children as well, and what happened is, we were on an outing and we said, okay, we're praying. So, you know, some of the sisters are exempt from praying on certain days. So, uh, someone was asking, one of the sisters was asking them, come, are you coming to pray? She says, no, I'm, I'm not praying. I'm not praying. Until they got to some of the young boys and they also tried it, I'm not praying. What do you mean I'm not praying? But how come they saying no? How, what do you mean how come they saying no? It's not just they, their choice. Anyway, these kids did not know what exactly was the shari rulings. I don't even know some of them. I don't even think some of them might have known what actually happens to females. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all our sisters and make easy for them whatever Allah has imposed upon them and whatever they go through. And the same applies to the males. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for us, we are happy with and we are not competing with Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make things easy for us. So... When it's difficult for you to do something, you do it. For the pleasure of Allah, that deed has value, greater value. Imagine you have just got to sleep because of all the stress of the world and all your worries and thoughts. You've been awake most of the night and an hour before Salatul Fajr, your eye closes. And mashallah, you're falling off. Beautiful dream and then your alarm rings. The clock, loud noise and you get up. And you sit up as much as you know, you love that sleep. As much as you know, it came after such a great effort. But you make sure you realize and understand. And you've lived up to the fact that your prayer comes before your sleep. Then you know, As-salatu khayrum min an nawm It will actually now hold that value. Imagine Allah has asked us through Muhammad wasallam to call people to that prayer in the morning saying, As-salatu khayrum min an Indeed, the prayer is better than sleep. So if you do that, you surely, you will earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters have hope. Like I said, everyone's going through difficulties. Not because Allah wants to make your life difficult, but because Allah wants to give you opportunities to get closer to Him. Look at it that way. You have a, an illness, you have a sickness, you may have arthritis, you may have just been, for example, diagnosed with something. You may be a person who doesn't have children. You may be a person who doesn't have male or female children, depending. You may be a person who's going through some marital crisis, some financial issue. It's not because Allah wants to put you through a problem. It's because Allah wants you to become closer to Him and to use these issues to earn your Jannah. He will give it to you. And if you are patient, by the will of Allah, he will get that paradise. So, so many different ways of entering Jannah. So many different deeds that please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just one thing. Someone will enter Jannah because of how much Allah gave them wealth and they used it. Someone will enter Jannah because Allah gave them an expertise, they used it. Someone will enter Jannah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with strength, they used it. Someone will enter Jannah because perhaps Allah put them somewhere at a place where or at a time when th there was a need for them and they helped out. Look at the floods that are happening across the globe in Chennai and in South America and so on. Those who are there and they are able and capable to help and they are helping and even from amongst us, if you're able and capable to reach out to those in need and you have reached out at that moment Allah is watching he knows it would be wrong for you who can swim perfectly well who is perhaps a very fit person who knows how to dive and at the same time people are drowning and you say it's okay you know like what they do nowadays someone drowning saying help help and they take out their, their cameras and they say okay yeah, one minute one minute I'm coming and they take everyone wants to take photos and someone says wait 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 don't go and help them right now one more one more have you heard the word one more when they're taking pictures one more how can you do that you need to know when to take the photograph and when not to take it people today are so obsessed that when there is a dire, desperate need of you to rush to the assistance of a person who's dying, you're more interested in taking the picture, documenting the scene. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our obsession with technology. And trust me, it affects everyone. Every one of us can do better when it comes to technology. Every one of us. 
And that's just a broad statement, but it's applicable to all, myself included. May Allah grant me goodness and make us all from among those whom goodness is granted to. Amen. So, there are so many narrations that make mention of these deeds that are loved by Allah. This evening, we want to talk about a group of people that I usually refer to as VIPs. Because in our language, VIP means a very important person. Imagine today, someone from the crowd who's sitting there and desperately wants to get to the front and suddenly your name is called out from here. Think about it for a minute. Wouldn't you be excited? Wow, hey, I'm going to go and sit in the front. Mashallah. You'd need a bit of a jersey or something. It's a bit nippy and cold here tonight. But anyway, you'd be excited. You know, these young men, brothers who are sitting right here, I'm sure they were at the back now thinking to themselves, you know what, the place is full, it's crowded. Well, to be honest, you were called right to the front. It doesn't mean come late next time, inshallah. Yeah, it's a bonus of coming late, isn't it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. And some others might be thinking, I came so early and I'm sitting in the middle. Don't worry. I want to give you an example. If your name was called out today, you would be so excited. As I entered, I saw some brothers and sisters looking so excited. I didn't know what to say. I just had to carry on walking. Salam. And I greeted them and walked. And I'm thinking to myself, may Allah grant them such excitement on the day of judgment. That is the true excitement. To be excited in this world is actually nothing. What is the true happiness? What is the true competition? It's to get to paradise. It's to be in Jannah. That day when we are given our books in the right hand, that is the day we will be super excited. In order to get it there, we need to work in this world in a way that whatever challenges Allah's put in our lives, mashallah, we will carry on, always looking happy. You won't know what type of stress perhaps I might have. You won't even know why. Because we are trained to be true believers who are smiling, come what may. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So this narration of VIP is very important persons. Imagine if your name is called on the day of judgment, the sun is so low, people are sweating, so much happening, everyone's worried, nafsi, nafsi, each person's worried about themselves, their deeds, the day of exposure, the day when all deeds may be laid bare. May Allah help us. Wallahi, if you don't want your deeds to be laid bare, there is a way out. Seek forgiveness. Allah wipes it out such that even the angels don't know what's going on. That's why I started off by saying Allah is merciful. Have hope. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that if you repent and you do good deeds, we will convert the bad you've done into good. Subhanallah. For the scales of the day of judgment, that's Allah. Allah makes mention of the punishment of those who commit sin and then he says the exception is of those who repent and do good deeds thereafter. So if you repent, the bad is wiped out. If you repent and do good deeds thereafter and your life has changed, then the bad comes back in a different form. What's the form? It comes onto the scale of good deeds because you have forsaken it for the sake of Allah. A person committing adultery habitually and they continue committing the sin one after the other and it becomes a habit. They are piling up their evil, isn't it? The sins are being piled up and there comes a day when they say, Oh Allah, I'm cutting it for your sake. Forgive me. I admit, I regret, I repent and I won't do it again. If they replace that with good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this particular verse, we will replace the evil that the people have done in the past. Those people who have repented and followed up with good deeds thereafter, we will, re we will replace that with good on the right side of the scale. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to give up the sins that we've been committing for so long. We all sin differently, some major, some minor. Let's try and have a little bit of shame. Let's try and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We call ourselves Muslimin. We want to see solutions to the problems that we're facing across the globe. The best way is to start off with ourselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us do that. So. Imagine on that day when it's the day of exposure, everything's going to come to the fore. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is an announcement being made saying, so and so 
there is a special place for you today. And suddenly it's your name. Your name. Wow. And you're excited. And the next thing, the next best thing perhaps is you're so excited going to this place that Allah has chosen for you. And you're so proud of the fact that what you did on earth really has helped. That's the day you're allowed to be proud. You know, pride is prohibited in this world. When I say pride here, I'm talking of the arrogant pride. I'm not talking about when someone says, I'm proud to be a Muslim. They're not arrogant to be a Muslim. They're proud means they're happy. So if you say I'm proud to be a Muslim, it means I'm happy to be a Muslim. I don't need to hide the fact that I'm a Muslim. You say I'm a proud Muslim. It doesn't mean I'm an arrogant Muslim because the two do not go hand in hand. In hand. The two are opposite poles. Pride and Islam, they don't really, they're not, they don't really come together. The Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, a person will not enter paradise if they have even a mustard seed's weight worth of pride in their heart. So it's just to show us that you need to deal with the pride that is arrogance within the heart. May Allah protect us from it. So the beautiful deed here that we're talking about is when a person is happy to be a Muslim, such that you don't have to hide your identity. You know, people say, it's so hard to be Muslim today. Well, there are billions of us. If every one of us happens to be living Islam, we will send the correct image across the globe and it will become easier to live as a Muslim. But if every one of us is going to hide our identity, when people look at us doing good deeds, they won't even know Muslims are doing good deeds. Why? Because the names have changed. They've become names that nobody can recognize as Muslimin. And the, the identity has changed completely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the shade on the day of judgment. I mean, so these VIPs will be called into what? They will be called into an area, a place. What is that place? Allah knows best. What exactly is that shade? It's a special shade from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The details regarding matters of belief should stop exactly where the verses stop or the authentic narrations stop. You need to know that. I cannot add one sentence and I cannot deduct one sentence. That is what we believe. So if someone says, give me the details of the shade, I can only give you what the messenger has said in authentic narrations. And if someone has disputed the authenticity of a narration, I can tell you, look, I can go this far, but I don't know beyond this. There's no point in entering territory of the, that which is unseen from your own whims and fancies, because it's not left to you and I to decide. It's up to Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who delivered the message of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. They let us know. And whatever they told us is enough for us. We don't need to know more. It's not difficult for us to say, look, I don't know. Someone asks me, for example, give me more details of the shade. I want to know what temperature is it going to be like? I say, I've got no clue. I don't even know if they're going to be measuring the temperature on that day, to be honest. And that's not a wrong answer. I don't know. But imagine someone says, I'm sure it'll be room temperature, 23 degrees. Where did you get that from? Just because you're comfortable with 23 degrees, you think that that's going to be okay there. So we don't know these details. Let's understand. People get entrapped by the details, juicy details that are given by people sometimes with beards. And that's nowhere to be found. So the man says, yes, don't worry. You look on your left, you'll see a bottle of Coke. Astaghfirullah. Where is that? Just because you like Coke does not necessarily mean you're going to get it in heaven. Not at all. Who knows? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. The reason I make mention of this is just to highlight the fact that we are sometimes entrapped by matters or in matters of belief by narrations that don't exist. Sometimes people want to add details just to make you say, wow, did you hear that? But where did you get the detail from my brother? Stop at the hadith, stop at the Quranic verse. These are matters of the unseen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So, we are being told or we were told that this is the, the shade of Allah. So when we say the shade of Allah, it's actually the shade created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some narrations say, say it's the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I do not have the capacity of giving you greater detail. All I know is that it is definitely a shade that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have on that particular day, which will protect the people, which will give them a very, very high status. It will definitely make them feel that they have been honored on that day. You know, when a child works hard throughout the year, at the end of the year, they want to see a prize at the school. And when they are called out, the names of the people are called out, the child is excited. 
The child is so excited, going up, wow, prize giving. They are honored on that day for what? For the hard work that they have engaged in throughout the year. You and I have a life. It's hard. Trust me, it is difficult. Many of us, myself included, there are days when you feel so low. But you keep on going. When people look at you, they think, wow, this person doesn't seem like they've got any problems in life. You don't know, I probably have a ton of problems more than you do. It's just the way you handle it. That's life. It's a challenge. This is your school. You have to work hard through the life. And at the end of it, do you know what will happen? You will get a reward. You will get a recompense by Allah. You will be definitely given something you will be happy uh, with from your maker. So these are the categories of people starting off. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He makes mention of it. He says seven categories of people will be given a special shape. This does not mean that there are only seven categories of people who will be honored on the day of judgment. No, there are so many other categories that will be honored in so many different ways. There are certain groups of people who will be granted entry without reckoning into Jannah. No reckoning. That's a bigger honor. That's a huge honor. Imagine if you are told, listen, we know that there's so much you've done, but we want to give you paradise without even looking at your deeds. Just walk straight through. You know, when you walk through, and I've always given this example because it affects us all when we travel. You're walking through the customs. Whether you have something or you don't have something, who likes to be stopped? No one. You want to be told, you know what? Just proceed. They look at you, they smile, they greet you sometimes. I hope they do. And then at the end of the day, you walk out and you're so excited. You're either excited because you had something and it was not declared. Or you're excited because you didn't have something and people were being stopped and you were not stopped so mashallah what what were you wearing maybe i should wear that clothing the next time i walk through subhanallah don't worry in this world that doesn't mean much although it makes us happy when it happens to you and i on the day of judgment may allah make it happen i mean you know that i mean could just have been the moment subhanallah so don't lose out on saying these i means may allah let it happen to us that we are given jannah without reckoning i mean Imagine you're told, listen, we just love this one deed you've done so much. We want to give you Jannah, no, no hisab, no adab, nothing, no punishment, no account, walk straight through. And you say, huh? I don't even know if that would happen because I don't think we'd have the time to even think about it. We'd just be sailing straight through. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give it to us. So there are so many categories of people who will be honored. Today we're only talking of a specific narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu made mention of in the most authentic books of hadith, it is narration muttafaq alayh, which means it's a narration that is agreed upon. It's of the highest level of authenticity. And I want to make mention to you something very interesting. If you look at the qualities I'm about to make mention of, you will notice something amazing. These are qualities of people who have sacrificed. They are people who, like yourselves and myself, who have tried on earth to do things. Imagine if there was only one thing and we were out of it, we would feel hopeless. But it can include any one of us, as you will notice in a few moments. Don't you want a special shade on the Day of Judgment? I do. We all do. So listen, the Prophet ﷺ says, the first of those people is Imam Adil. Imam Adil. Now, there was an Egyptian actor known as Adil Imam. I don't know if you've heard him or if you heard about him. I think he died some time back. And there was one man who actually said, well, he died. And I said, what are you talking about? He died. I said, this is talking of a quality. If you don't know the Arabic language, don't just jump to meanings. Please go and ask people who know. And the reason I say this is some of us don't have a clue. And we just think this is what it means and that's what it means. No, go back to the authentic sources in order to learn what it means. Imam means a leader. Adil means just. A ruler who is just. And the scholars have included in that category anyone given any form of leadership or authority who fulfills it with justice. Allah says you deserve, you deserve to have a VIP status on the Day of Judgment. You deserve to have this special shade on the Day of Judgment because you had authority. You could have done whatever you wanted while you were in authority, but you didn't. You were fearful of Allah. You were just. 
When your own family members did wrong, you made sure you stood up and told them you're doing wrong. When your enemies did what was right, you made sure that you acknowledged it even though they were your enemies. Today, we look at people and we say, well, this person is not a Muslim. You know what? I don't need to even look. I don't. Can I tell you, your reaching out to those who are non-Muslim could also be your ticket to heaven. It could. Like I always say, somewhere up the ladder, our forefathers were not Muslim. Someone worked on them. Someone spoke to them. Someone did something good to them by the will of Allah, by the permission of Allah. That's how they turned to Islam. And so generations later, we are Muslim. Or sometimes we ourselves have reverted to Islam because of that. Because of someone doing good to us. Imagine if we were not. Imagine if we were not in interaction with Muslims. And if we were not Muslimin. How would we have known about Islam and the goodness, especially with it being bombarded on a, on a global level? Like I said, due to the actions of a few misguided ones. How? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to be kind to one and all. I always like to give an example of the animals. And I say, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that paradise shall be given to certain people who were kind to animals, and if Allah has written that you should be compassionate towards animals, don't you think for a moment that that compassion when directed to fellow human beings who perhaps follow a different faith would be far, far more important and much greater in reward. If quenching the thirst of a dog can earn you paradise, then what about quenching the thirst of a human being? Surely it will earn you paradise in an even quicker way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. So, the first category, Imam is a leader. Adil means a person who is just. It teaches us the importance of justice. And it teaches us this even if you're not a leader. In our lives, every one of us has a certain type of leadership. You know the hadith says, Kullukum ra' wa kullukum mas'ulun ar ra'iyati. Each one of you, each one of you, is a leader or Ra here would refer to a person who is responsible each one of you is responsible you have certain duties to fulfill and each one of you is responsible for the way you fulfill those duties imagine you're a mother in the home you're a father you're the manager you're the boss you're the ceo you're a person whom a few people work under or you're just an ordinary individual working you could have cheated you could have done things against what was right or against the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But guess what? You didn't. And you were honest, you were upright. Because you knew that if Allah is saying a leader who is just gets such a high status on the day of judgment, then surely justice is something great. You follow the point? I need to be just. I need to be fair. I need to be a person who stands firm and upright upon that which is balanced and correct. No matter who it is, sometimes we side with family members in a dispute just because for us, blood is thicker than water, as they say. But we are taught that even if your own family members are wrong, you have to acknowledge it. You have to say, listen, you know what? You are my son. You are my brother. You are whoever. You are my family. But you know what? In this issue, you are wrong. It's not easy. It's not easy to be just. When Allah tells you you have paradise for a deed, you need to know that deed is not just to walk through the park. No, it's going to be difficult. Imagine leadership starting from the highest level. Meaning if you're a leader of a nation, it includes that definitely and it seeps down. And in fact, as a lesson, it gets to all of us. The lesson, the importance of justice in Islam. Wow. Allah says if you are just, then you deserve a special VIP status. Now, pause there for a moment. When you have leaders on earth, no matter who they are, you have someone who you look up to and they, they have leadership in them. Allah has bestowed upon them some form of leadership. They are normally VIPs, right? In this world. Who would want that VIP status snatched away from them? Nobody. Imagine you tasted what it feels like to have, wow, authority, a bit of power, a, a say, a clout. And suddenly you're the man, subhanallah. You know, you're the person. You're the woman, so to speak. Everything happens according to you. Would you like that to be snatched away from you? The answer is no. 
Well, Allah says, hang on, you might be a VIP on earth, but there is one way of getting VIP status in the hereafter as well. And that is, while you are a VIP on earth, you need to make sure you use those days to humble yourself, to be just, to be fair with everyone, to be concerned about someone standing right at the back there. The same way you are concerned about those who are seated in the front. I'm just giving you an example. It's unfair for me to just say, you know what? How's it guys? You guys okay? And I'm concentrating on these few faces. Again, they came later than those. And look where they are sitting. Mashallah. Wow. That's just from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, it's unfair for me to ignore the rest. I feel in my heart that if I could have given each one of the people a little bit of time, I would have. But honestly, we are human beings. There needs to be understanding on both sides. But at the same time, let's leave that. We are just mere mortals. We are human beings. Let's talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He loves justice so much that definitely that quality, if we were to instill it in our own lives, and if we were to try and be as just as possible, come what may, the VIP status will never be snatched away from us. Those who were in authority will remain on a high pedestal, even on the day of judgment. Because nobody in authority wants that to be snatched away in a way that they are disgraced. Imagine a person was a huge leader and suddenly disgraced, they cannot even walk on the street. Who wants that? May Allah protect us. We don't want that to happen in the hereafter. You might have had it in the world. You want to preserve it and continue it and take it further? It's quite simple. You need to be just. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Let's move to the next quality. Now it includes most of us. The hadith says, gives hope. And imagine if the hadith stopped there. Okay, there's one person whom Allah will give a sh- you know, the special shade on the day of judgment. And that is uh, a just ruler. And it stopped there. We would look at the narration and say, well, it doesn't apply to me. I'm sure people would say, it doesn't apply to me. Although, I've just proven to you that it does apply because it... It depicts the importance of justice, doesn't it? It does. It shows you how important justice is. If that's what a person will get, then definitely justice is something grand. However, Allah's mercy dictates that He won't just stop at one category. He wants to give you a chance also. You know, today to rub shoulders with the VIPs is a big mission. It's an issue. You want to meet someone, you either meet them by chance, by luck, or, you know, when we say luck here, I better clarify we're not talking of something un-Islamic. I just mean something chosen by Allah and you had absolutely no role to play in that. You know, tonight Allah gave you a role to play in attending or in watching if you're watching the live stream. What was that role? Allah gave you the energy and so on and so forth. You had to make the effort to come. That effort was yours. Allah gave you the ability and then He allowed you to do it. Right. So yes, this was planned by Allah. But imagine... If nobody planned, I was sitting in an aircraft and I sat next to a really, really important person whom I wanted to meet. That wasn't planned by me. It was totally and absolutely planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was a moment I got that was something, I'm sure you're itching to know who that was. Anyway, let's leave that. But at the same time, it was something from Allah. This is, I'm just showing you the difference between the two. So when, when I say it was just luck, I'm not talking of the un-Islamic thing where people say, oh, you know, lots are not to be drawn and you know, there's luck and we don't believe in luck and so on. Everything is planned by Allah. Nobody's contesting that. All we're saying is it was something where Allah alone, without any role of yours to be played with your energy, your effort, had decided and chosen. There's a, a difference between the two. It's always Allah alone. But sometimes Allah gives you the ability. If you don't do it, you won't get it. If you do it, you get it. And Allah already knew what would happen. But... You had to play the role. I mean, nobody can sit at home and say, I want to go to Al-Manar Center. But if Allah wills, I'll get there. For now, I'm just in bed. (laughs) I hope you're still listening over live stream. (laughs) May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you goodness. So my brothers and sisters, it's something that's there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants all of us to have hope. So he's included more categories. If he wanted, he could have taught us six categories, 20 categories, 50 categories, five categories. But we have seven categories. Who chose that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who brought it to us? The messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So the second category, shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillahi ta'ala. The youth, a young male or female, female is included in this. It's the Arabic terminology, shabun. It's referring to a specific youth, a youth, a young person who grows up in the obedience of Allah. I see there's silence. A lot of people are saying, well, I'm already grown up. <laughs> Don't worry. You, you're also going to have more categories where you will be included. Allah's mercy includes that. But let's pause for a moment and take a look at this. As you're growing older, you get to your teenage. You know, nowadays it starts a little bit earlier. The irritations because of perhaps, I think, technology and so many other things, the way we eat and whatever else it is. So many other reasons. You know, normally when you get to about 12, then... 13. 13, they say these are the teenagers. That's what they call teenagers. Why? Because adolescent years, a little bit difficult. Transformation from childhood to adulthood. That transformation, some never transform. I called one man, I said, how old are you? He said, 60. I said, I think you are 60 teen. He said, why? You're acting like a teenager, man. Some people never transform. Have you noticed? They're childish. They behave, they misbehave throughout their lives. They never settle down. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us settle. And some, you don't even notice, they're so matured from a young age. 12, 13, 14, they're okay. And 13 sometimes, they're young. And, but they're still, mashallah. However, there is a transformation even physically. And Allah knows that. And Allah knows you will be going through challenges, hormonal changes. Allah knows you will be having days where you might be frustrated. There might be things happening. You think you're the most powerful person on earth. A lot of the young people at a certain age think they can beat up Mike Tyson and everybody put together. That's how they think. Because why? You bubbling, bursting with energies, everything happening. And Allah says, obviously, such a young person, if they grow up in the obedience of Allah, they are sowing the seeds of a day when they will be given the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, special shade. This would have to include parental involvement or it would have to involve the parents or guardians or someone who teaches you, who tells you, who speaks to you and keeps reminding you in a beautiful way. Because if you're a young person and you're growing up, you would need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, listen, in these years, if you're calm, if you're cool, you try your best to grow up in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't just let loose. You know, you have these urges, like I said, hormonal changes, perhaps levels of testosterone, you know, fluctuating and so on. You don't just go out and start doing what you wish. So the clubs have you registered every day, you know. Ticked off. Yes, this guy is there. He's there. He's there. No. Sins to be committed. Wallahi, they're available. It's anyone who wants to commit a sin. The sins are available. What makes you better is when you can control yourself for the sake of Allah. Be a human being. Don't just release yourself. I tell you, sins come with a lot of depression. They bring about regret. If not today, then tomorrow. And Allah says you can cut it by repenting. You can seek Allah's forgiveness. Subhanallah. It's amazing. You just say, Oh Allah, I've had my bad ways, my bad habits. I've committed this sin, that sin. I admit, I regret. I seek your forgiveness and I won't do it again. And Allah says, the sin is wiped out. Guess what? You do not ever need to confess a sin to anyone. No matter who they are. Besides Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, I confess to Allah. That's what makes me a Muslim. You don't need to tell a soul what you've done. That's part of Islam. Your respect is intact. Allah covered you when you were sinning. Do you think He's going to expose you when you've been repenting? Subhanallah. So the hadith says a young person. And youth here means people with energy. I don't think there's a cap to it. You know, I can't just tell you, look, it's from 13 to 30. I cannot say that. Youth. Someone who's growing up. You grow up in the obedience of Allah. So as you're young, You've matured. Guess what? Your books are now opened. You know the hadith says, Rufi'al qalamu an thalath. The pen is lifted from three people. That means the angels do not record the deeds of three people. Whatever you see in your dream, you're not responsible for. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a person went in his dream and he did something, he's not responsible. She's not responsible for what she dreamt. He dreamt. That's part of this hadith. It's the first category of people. 
Similarly, a person who is insane, they're not in the right frame of mind or they're not, they're mad, so to speak, you know, they're not in their mind. They will not be held responsible for their utterances and their actions. For as long as certain conditions are met, I'm just saying that a person who's not in their mind, they're not held responsible, accountable for deeds and actions. And the third category is يحتلم, a child until the child becomes physically, sexually mature. The child is mature now, so you've got to an age. Once you get to that age, the angels begin to write your deeds. So your salah better have been in order before that. This is why the hadith speaks of encouraging your kids to fulfill their prayer at the age of seven and disciplining them in that regard at the age of 10 and so on. The hadith continues because by the time they get to that age where they, they are now considered uh, having arrived at the age of puberty and the books are opened, what would happen? You want all their prayers to be written from day one. So this person grew up in the obedience of Allah. May Allah make it easy for us as parents to look after our children. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for our children. And you know, like I said earlier, the environment sometimes is very difficult. And it's the same applies to the television and various other forms of media. As much as it's important to know what's going on, it's important to also know whether you're being brainwashed or not. Very important. To also know whether... What you are watching and seeing and believing is actually the fact. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I mean, so a, a young person growing up in the obedience of Allah, they kept themselves clean. They kept themselves with a good slate as best as possible. They avoided major sin and they tried their best to obey Allah's instruction and so on. Allah says, you know what? Because you controlled the bubbling energy and the bursting energy that was there and you made sure you channeled it towards the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to give you a VIP status on the Day of Judgment. Subhanallah. It's worth it. Now let's go back to the lesson I drew when we spoke about justice. From this, what I learned also is the importance of controlling your energies and your desires. Control them. It's better for you. Control it. If Allah says He's going to give the, those who grow up having controlled themselves a special place on the Day of Judgment, then surely that controlling itself must be such an important thing. And it is. So now comes the people who say, well, you know what? I either fell during these years, so I'm not included in this category, or I'm already old, so I'm not included in this category. And I did whatever I wanted to when I was younger. So... The mercy of Allah dictates that there will be more categories that will be spoken about. Rajulun qalbuhu mu'allakum bil masajid. A man whose heart is hanging in the house of Allah, in the masjid. That's the literal translation. Let's go further. The women might say, what about us? That's a very good question. What about you? That's right. You have the right to ask that question. Well... This is to do with the importance of the prayer, turning to Allah, the houses of Allah when it comes to the men and the salah itself when it comes to the females. But they're both included in it. Indeed, if it's a sister and she's concerned about the next prayer, the moment she finishes the current prayer, then it, her heart is hanging at the place of worship. And this is why the term masjid, Linguistically refers to a place of sujood. Did you know that? Masjid. It's a place where you put your head down. So generally you have a sajjada. They call it a sajjada. Meaning it's, it's the term used to refer to the piece of cloth or the little carpet or whatever you would like to lay down in order to put your head down to sajda. Sajda means prostration in the Arabic language. So sajjada taken from sajda. Sujood, masjid, also from the same root. It's where you put your head down to the ground. So the sisters are included if their hearts were hanging to the place of prayer the next time they had to make the prayer. What is meant by my, the heart is hanging in the house of Allah or in the masjid? Imagine the hadith didn't say Baytullah, but it includes Baytullah, meaning the house of Allah. If you read Salatul Fajr, for example, in the house of Allah, and as you come out, you're wondering, where am I going to make my dhuhr today? Am I going to be here 
okay, I will go to that masjid because I'm going to work and I have an errand and I'm going to be at that place, for example, so I'm going to go there. What happened? Your concern for the next prayer will lead you to this VIP status on the Day of Judgment. I'm concerned. So I'm not talking about the current prayer. I'm talking about your concern for the next one. Because your heart is literally stuck there. You need to go there. You know when you're in love and they say, Oh, where's your heart? Oh, my heart is in... And then you mention the country where your wife is, for example. I hope. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it clean and halal. My heart is there. What does that mean? Oh, I'd love to go there, mashallah. Why? Oh, someone I love is there, isn't it? Subhanallah, exciting. We get so excited when it comes to something of that nature. What about where, if someone says, where's your heart? It's stuck in the masjid. Why? Hey, I don't want to miss my next prayer. Wow. Wow. MashaAllah. It means, I just love Allah so much. I can't wait to be in communication with Him. Once again, in a specific way, known as prayer, at this place where He asks me to go. Wow. I want to go for Allah. So I want to go again. Brothers and sisters, Make an effort to fulfill your prayer on time. One of the biggest traps of the devil. And perhaps we may speak about it tomorrow. We have a topic connected to this, to the prayers. Is him convincing you that there is still time for your prayer? That's the first trap, the biggest trap. A person who is regular with their prayers, for example. Shaitan says, hang on, you just heard the adhan. There's still another two hours to go for the ending of the time. You say, yeah, you're right. And you carry on doing your work. Suddenly, two hours, five minutes finished. And you say, oh no, I missed the prayer. So if your heart is always hanging in the masjid, for example, or the place where sujood is supposed to be. And like we said, the proper meaning here, referring to the masjid, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for the sisters, it would obviously include... The place where you're going to make the sajda. I'm interested in the next one. So therefore, you deserve the status. My connection with the one who is the owner of the day of judgment was more important to me than my connection with anyone else. Therefore, he on the day of judgment decided that I will get a VIP status. Do you follow the point? Someone might say, why? Why does Allah want to give a status to such a person? Well, they were interested in Allah. This is why there's a powerful narration that raises the hair. Do you know what it says? Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa. Whoever loves to meet with Allah, looking forward to it. Guess what? Allah loves to meet with you and looking forward to it too. Wow. You love to meet with Allah? You want to meet with your maker? Well, your maker wants to meet with you too. Subhanallah. Hadith says, whoever goes close to Allah, a handspan, Allah gets closer to him, a whole foot, more than that. Whoever walks towards Allah, Allah comes to him rushing, which means Allah comes even quicker than you can. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us his help. May Allah grant us Jannah. So this is the, the third category. We spoke about Imamun Adil. I'm sure you've understood what that means. Right? Shabun. The young person who grew up in the obedience of Allah. A person whose heart is hanging in the place of sujood, the masjid. Who gives importance to salah. Brothers and sisters, before I move to the fourth, let me inform you or let me remind yourselves and myself. We can improve when it comes to prayer. Timing, quality and then quantity. We can improve. If your timing is right, you can improve on your quality. If your quality is right, then you can improve on your quantity. There's no point in making so many units of prayer. You know, they're known as raka'at. So many units of prayer, so many raka'at. But each one of them is just like, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You know, there, was, there were two kids reading Salat al Taraweeh. You know, Taraweeh is known for, you know, Ferrari and so on. Speed up. I'm sure you've seen it on the internet. I saw it. And wallahi, it's an embarrassment. That's not an act of worship. That's an insult to Allah. I'd rather you don't pray that in that way. Insulting Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can you reduce salah that is voluntary to something that is such a big burden on your shoulders that you just want to get done with it and move? Is that how you treat your maker? Come on. Imagine if, you were, if your loved one had to treat you like that. To say, ah, it's okay. Astaghfirullah. You wouldn't like it. 
So why would you like to treat Allah like that? Take your time in prayer. You need to feel the calmness of the prayer. You need to feel the goodness in that prayer. This is when you will achieve. So these kids were reading their Salat at Taraweeh at one of the schools, one of the madrasas, and they were being told that, you know what, we're going to be watching. Everyone's going to be leading because you guys, you, you, you are studying the Quran and you guys are uh, memorizing. So you need to, you know, two, three, two, three guys need to read the Salah so that you can memorize and you can revise the Quran. So this one guy's reading. And in fact, they were sitting and chatting. And as the teacher walks in and they hear the footsteps and they don't know their work, they don't know what to read. The only thing they know is what I'm about to say. And so the youngster gets up and he says, Ya'lamun, Allahu Akbar. And the next time he says, Ta'lamun, Allahu Akbar. And the next time he says, Yattaqun, Allahu Akbar. How can you treat Allah like that? Ya'lamun, tattaqun, ta'lamun. Is that what it's all about? Anyway, those who are kids, there are some adults who literally follow the quickest mosque. A lot of us are guilty of this. Am I right? Am I right? Be honest, am I right? They all said yes themselves. Did you hear that? May Allah forgive us all, myself included. Wallahi, when you, when you are close to Allah, in prayer, time means nothing. Nothing. If you want to know that you are close to Allah, ask yourself, am I concerned about the timing when it comes to prayer? Those of us who are Imams from amongst us here or those who might hear this later, I'm not saying test the patience of those behind you, please. We're not saying that. You know, they complained to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith, Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, when he was sent to Quba to lead. And there was a complaint about the fact that he used to read long salah, long. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, hey, are you trying to cause a problem here? Stick to these surahs. And he gave him, you know, roughly how much you should read. Don't prolong it so long. That subhanallah, people become so angry. I'm sure you've heard the one about uh, the, the, the new Muslim who entered there and he was reading his salah and suddenly the imam continued reading and he continued reading. And this, he's standing in prayer and the imam continued and everybody's standing and he's thinking to himself, you know what? This is just Salatul Fajr. It's the beginning of the day. And this man is reading. It's been 20 minutes and he's carrying on. Anyway, he was patient because he didn't know much. When he finished, he asks, Hey, 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 tell me something. What was he reading? So the guy next to him says, No, this is an important surah. It's a, it's a surah in the Quran. What's it called? It's called Baqarah. What does that mean? It means the cow. It means the cow. So the guy says, Okay. Wow. Okay, I know it's long. It's a long surah. So he knows now when he comes to a salah, he's going to ask, hey, what surah is being read? If it's the cow, he says, hey, you know what? <laughs> so he arrives at Salatul Maghrib and the Imam starts off. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil. So he asks, hey, what surah is this? Someone says, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. What do you mean don't worry? What's the surah? He says, it's called al-fil. What does that mean? Elephant. <gasps> If the cow was so long, imagine what the elephant will be like. <laughs> Foolish behavior. Is that how you treat Allah? Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. That's terrible. Unacceptable. When it comes to time and your prayer, especially when it comes to voluntary prayers, don't spoil the reward of your voluntary taraweeh, for example, by running after that which is the quickest. You don't do that. Your heart should be with your salah. I'm going, I want a correct recitation that I can follow. And at the same time, it's not too slow that it agitates people and not too fast that the words are being minced. Now people might say, well, you know what? That's a tough one for me to be included in the category of those whose hearts are stuck to the next salah or to the prayer or uh, to the masjid and so on. It's a bit of a tough one. So hang on. Promise yourself you will work towards it. That's good enough. Promise yourself, you will work towards it. That's good enough. As a beginning. But if you're sitting here and saying, Nah, I don't think I can make that. You've given up before you've even started. Don't do that. So let's go to the next category. More hope. Rajulun qalbuhu mu'allakum bil masajid. Then we have, Rajulani tahabba fillahi 
ijtama'a alayhi wa tafarraqa alayhi. Two men. The term men is used, but it would also include two sisters, two females, who love each other for the sake of Allah. Love each other for the pleasure of Allah. They come together in the pleasure of Allah. They leave each other in the pleasure of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, you love each other for the sake of Allah. You love each other for my sake. Allah says, well, you deserve a VIP status on the day of judgment. You know what? It's not easy to love someone for the sake of Allah. What brings us together? It's solely Allah. Why are you here tonight? I hope it's solely Allah. I love you for the pleasure of Allah. Yes, indeed you do. And so do I. What that means, let me inform you of something interesting. The love for the pleasure of Allah is very broad. You feel it when you see people trying to obey Allah's instruction in one way or another. And that makes you feel the connection. So I'm walking in the streets of London, for example. And I see a sister dressed like a proper Muslim. I've got no clue who she is. And I see her perhaps pushing her little kid's stroller and so on. And I know how difficult it is to dress that way. And I will never know who she was. And in my mind I say, Subhanallah, I feel the connection. She will never know me, I will never know her. What's connecting me to her? The fact that she's trying to please Allah. She's doing something to please Allah. Oh Allah, help her. Oh Allah, grant her goodness. Oh Allah, make it easy for her. This can happen at an airport, at a public place, Muslim country, non-Muslim country. Imagine you get into the masjid. Now, if it is a person of the opposite sex, you do not have to tell them that, you know what, I love you for the pleasure of Allah. But if it's a person of the same sex, it's a sunnah to actually tell them if you can. You know, I recall these people and it happens a lot of the times where you have youngsters. They say, they tell some girl, I love you for the pleasure of Allah. Okay. Is that like a password? You know, for the pleasure of Allah. Does that make the first part of it halal? You know, relax. Take it easy. You can just make dua for them. Allah knows that you care for them. The pleasure of Allah. And you love them. There's nothing wrong in loving your sisters in Islam for the pleasure of Allah. But there's something wrong in what you do with it. If it really is for the pleasure of Allah, you know its limits. You know its lines. You know what to do with it. You know what to say. You know when to say it. You know if you have to say things how to say them, and so on. I remember I told this one young couple who said, no, no, no. I said, how did you get to know each other? Interesting question. No, you know, we were, we were studying together the same year. Oh, mashallah. And you know, she was such a good child. Mashallah. Well, you, you're a child calling her a child as well. That's what it is. But at the same time, how did it develop? Well, I told her that, you know what? I love you for the pleasure of Allah. And that's where it started. Okay. So, Love for the pleasure of Allah became love for my own pleasure. That's what happened. Love for the pleasure of Allah became love for my own pleasure. Make it halal. That will continue love for the pleasure of Allah. You can love your family members for the pleasure of Allah. But Allah has given you a different type of love when it comes to your father and mother. I can love my father for the pleasure of Allah. And I can dislike him for the pleasure of Allah. But... I have a different type of a love, a filial love, for example. I have a different type of a love and a connection that is there that would make me fulfill his rights even if he was not a Muslim. Because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when it comes to others, yes, I love you for the pleasure of Allah and that's it. Subhanallah. However, you happen to now do business with the person, you happen to now do so much more with the person, no problem. You still love them for the pleasure of Allah. And you will still guide them. You will still help them. When they guide you, you will take the guidance. You know, if you love someone for the sake of Allah, when they correct you, you take the correction. Because you know, hey, this person told me what's right and wrong and I need to... This is for the sake of Allah. And when they tell you something, subhanallah, the other way around, if you were to tell them something, they should be ready to take it. Subhanallah. So, let's understand... That when you see someone, for example, in the masjid, in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you enter and you see an old man in one corner reading salah and he's trying, he's in sujood. Don't tell yourself this man is boasting, he's arrogant, he's showing off. This lady, for example, started wearing this hijab and so on. She just wants to show off. No, have a good thought that look, this person is trying to obey Allah. So I love them. 
I mean, I'm so, I wish I was in that hand. I, I was in that position where I could also read salah in such a way. And at this age, when I am so old like him, perhaps Allah, may Allah grant me the ability to do that. It encourages us. It motivates us to do good. That's what is the benefit of love in Allah is. It will motivate us and help us collectively to do good and encourage us. To head in the right direction. This is why it is so important. Like I said, when Allah says you're going to get something big in return for a deed, that deed is something serious. It's not just a minor thing. It has some broad, great benefit. You love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine you're at work and you speak to your colleagues about Allah and about Islam and they show such a keen interest and suddenly Against all odds, they enter the fold of Islam. Now when people enter the fold of Islam, for example, they have challenges. What are the challenges? Their family members, their workplace, their dress code, their prayer place, so many other things, their friends. A lot changes and it changes dramatically and drastically. And many of them have a vacuum that is not filled properly that only Allah can fill because a lot of us take 10 steps back. We're interested in someone reverting and after the reversion, what happened? Well, I don't know. The last I saw them was the day they reverted. What did you do? You should love them enough for the sake of Allah to follow through. To say, subhanallah, they are as clean as ever. I was in Nigeria two days back and there was someone who entered the fold of Islam. A sister. And I told her, I said, you know what? You're cleaner than us who are born Muslimin because your slate and your book is just opened now. So please pray for us. And she was like, what do you mean? And I had to explain that Islam deletes whatever was before it. If you reverted to Islam, everything bad you did in the past is gone, it's cut. So you've got the best of slates at the moment. And I encouraged the brothers and sisters to follow up with them. To say, listen, don't just abandon them and leave them. So love for the sake of Allah. You will reach out for the sake of Allah. You will do things for the pleasure of Allah. You will do things in order to earn a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to clarify one point. I've come across some people, sometimes even wealthy people. They tell you, look, I'm doing this, but I don't want a reward. I don't want acknowledgement. I don't want anything. What do you mean you don't want a reward? No, I'm just doing it because I've got this money. Who gave you the money to do it? Well, Allah. Well then Allah wants you to do this expecting a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I don't understand it. I just want to do it from the goodness of my heart. That heart belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants you to do it to earn a reward. If he wanted, he could have removed you from the equation. He did not need you. So much good is happening without you and me. I mean the floods in Chennai for example. Who's helping? If you're not helping, no problem. Others are helping. People are helping and assisting. It's not like nobody's going to assist. Everyone's going to sit back and relax and watch it on TV. Even if it means $5, $2, people are giving. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. May He grant us goodness. You love people for the sake of Allah. You reach out to them. You care for them. So much so that the hadith says that al mu'minuna kal bunyan. You know, the believers are like a building. You know, a building, the bricks are all together. Go and see how it is. And another narration says, like one body. If a single organ of the body is complaining of pain, the entire body is restless and suffers insomnia because it's just one little nail on the baby finger that's affected. What happened? The whole body is affected. Concern. Concern. Your love for someone for the pleasure of Allah would definitely be displayed through concern you have for them as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and may we learn to love one another for the sake of Allah. There is an issue and a problem that we face. Today, you see someone trying to obey Allah's instruction. The first thing that some people's minds are driven to, you don't like the person. You look at for a difference between you and them. Don't do that. Don't go out hunting for differences. And don't just dislike someone because perhaps they read salah slightly different from you. Or they have their finger in tahiyyat slightly different from yours. No, that's the devil's plan to make you hate one another. Today, one of the biggest reasons that we are being, or we are struggling and suffering the way we are, is because even those who are like-minded have become disunited over small items. Minor matters, petty things have divided us. 
I don't like you brother. Why? Because of the way you have your mustache. It's got nothing to do with you. Come on man. Subhanallah. Did I steal the hair from your face or something? Subhanallah. What a silly, silly example. But that's how petty people have become. We dislike each We look for a reason why we don't like the sister. Okay, the sister, for example, struggled through her life. You don't know her struggles. And now, mashallah, she's putting on something. She's trying to cover herself. And you pass a cutting comment and you don't even know. You've just, you know, thrown everything away. At least they're putting on some. Not everyone's on your level. No. They won't be on your level of piety. And guess what? When you start thinking that you are more pious than them, that's where the problem is. I always say, when someone thinks they're holier than you, yes, they're not talking about piety, they're talking about holes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. They have holes in their heart, they have holes in their minds, they have holes all over. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not let that happen to us. Let's move on. So we spoke about those two who love each other for the sake of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. What brought you together was Allah. Or for example, you tend, you, there was a link that became strong because of Allah. This person is doing good. This person obeys Allah. This person is trying. This person has quit sin. This person is trying to read salah and so on. And I care for them. I love them for the sake of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Beautiful. Then there is an issue that is of extreme importance. And what I love about this hadith, it is straight to the point. No coverings. No candy coating. You know, no icing. The hadith says, رَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُ إِمْرَأَةٌ ذَاتُ مَنْصَبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ A man who was called to commit adultery or to fornicate by a woman who was so beautiful and she had a high status. Everything was there. Facilitation. There was no way that there was an obstacle between the two except the consciousness of Allah. So the man says, I fear Allah, I won't do this. And the same applies in the other way. If a man happens to call a woman to commit the same sin, and it's all facilitated, and the man is a big boss, and he's a top person, and for example, he's a good looking guy as well, and everything is there, and it's going to be done in secret, nobody's going to know. And the woman says, I fear Allah. I'd rather lose my job than to sleep with my boss. Allahu Akbar. The hadith is so direct. Can you believe? So direct. Imagine if this is the status of a person who turned down an offer only for the sake of Allah. What do you think is the crime of a person who makes the offer? And on the globe at the moment, how much have we heard of women being abused? They are told, you know what, you have a problem with something, whether it's your permit, whether it's your something else, your work, your job is at stake. But you know what, if you do me a sexual favor, I get it done for you. As easy as that. The choice is yours, now you can walk out of that door. And the woman is crying and she's literally depressed. How can this have happened? This man... I've respected him. He has respect. He enjoys it in society. He is the boss. If he wants, he can sign it. But he wants something dirty from me to take my honor, my dignity. Allah says, if you say no, you will be a VIP on the day of judgment. Now, do you know why you deserve it? You might have lost your job. You might have lost your status. You might have had your permit revoked. You might have had everything. Allah says, I'm watching. That was your one ticket to heaven. Allah. And I'm quite sure this problem is becoming more and more common because we are living in an immoral, indecent world at the moment, which is becoming more and more immoral and indecent. Didn't I tell you the hadith was straight to the point? We could say blunt, which means, you know, it just came straight. Brothers and sisters, fear Allah. Those who are calling towards this, what will you get from a moment of pleasure? Dishonoring a female or the other way around. This hadith speaks about a man saying no. Someone might ask why? Why didn't the hadith say the woman saying no? I tell you why. Women will generally, in fact for a man when everything is facilitated, it becomes difficult to say no. People know women would probably hold back a man. He's a man. 
He'll say, yes, why not? It's all facilitated. He needs more power to say no than a woman. A woman by nature, she wouldn't move into this type of immorality so quickly. With a man, you and I know, it's different. That's why the women say, ah, those are men. You know, they look at you and they keep on looking at you. They keep on looking at you. And the man's got a beard to the ground. And he's still looking at you. And then he gives you evidence from the hadith to prove that his look is okay. It's still the first look. <laughs> How dare you? Number one is you're doing wrong. Number two is you embarrassing the people. And number three is you want to present your religious evidence to suit what you've just done now. Astaghfirullah. You know, I was in Nigeria two days ago and we sat with some of the panelists and one of them, a local Nigerian sheikh, and he was speaking about how when something comes on your screen as you are on your phone or laptop and it happens to be haram, you know, you have a nude image, you have someone you're not supposed to be looking at. So what are you supposed to do? He said, look, the first glance is yours, which means you can... How did you know it was bad? Because you looked at it instead of Astaghfirullah and you quickly... I either changed the page or did something. But he says, nowadays they say, Astaghfirullah, look at this. Astaghfirullah. Hey, hey guy, check at this. Now, look. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Look at what they've got here, guys. You know? And you spend 20 minutes saying Astaghfirullah. You've defeated the purpose. Wallahi, that's the reality. It's happening. You saw it. Delete it and carry on. Don't infest your mind with it. And don't use a religious excuse and keep on uttering Allah's name and keep on looking at that. That's blaspheme, man. That's insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a reality. People are doing it. That's why I'm talking about it. I found it really funny when he said it, so I'm sharing it with you today. So this is the thing. If you can hold yourself back, control yourself, your sexual desires, control them. It's a direct indication, direct instruction to say, control yourself. Now people might say, you know what, I've fallen in the past. Well, go back to the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah and you will find narrations that make it clear that you can still be forgiven. Those who have committed immorality, adultery, fornication, whatever other immor immorality it is. Those who have committed immorality or oppressed themselves in one way or another and then remember Allah and that leads them to seeking Allah's forgiveness. The rest of the verses say, Allah will forgive them. Who is going to forgive them besides Allah? Who forgives sins besides Allah? So then Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ جَزَاؤُهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَجَنَّاتٌ For them there will be forgiveness from their Lord and there will be gardens of paradise. Who are those? Those who committed the sin, they committed adultery, they committed fornication, they committed so many different types of immoral deeds. But... They turned to Allah, they sought forgiveness, they came back to Allah, they asked His forgiveness. Allah says, we will forgive them and grant them paradise still. Wow, didn't I start off by saying, have hope in the mercy of Allah? Shaitan comes to you and makes you depressed, even after you've asked Allah's forgiveness. And shaitan comes to make you ask yourself, will I ever be forgiven? The answer is, you've already been forgiven perhaps by Allah. Why depress yourself? Move on. The, don't let the past bog you down with regret that leads to depression. No, you regret in order to repent. You don't regret in order to become depressed. You have to carry on with your life. None of us seated here can say we're perfect, we haven't sinned. Yes, the nature of sin differs from person to person. But those warm tears that roll down the cheeks seeking the forgiveness of Allah... That's what will earn you Jannah and paradise and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So take it easy. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask His forgiveness. And remember, always control yourself. Try your best. Wherever you faltered, turn back to Allah quickly. It starts off sometimes by a mere message. The message is either on WhatsApp or perhaps BBM or maybe 
social media, a little DM on Instagram or something. And then it goes further. And it goes further and further until shaitan makes sure that he gets you exactly where he wants to get you. Well, I tell you, if you have already fallen, come out of it. You can snap out of it, come out of it for the sake of Allah. And if you're a man and you'd like to get it halal, trust me, there are ways of getting it halal. You have no excuse in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing whatsoever. Allah says, I made it simple for you and easy for you to get it done legitimately, legally. You chose the devil's way. Why? May Allah strengthen us all. May Allah help us honor one another. I told you this applies both ways, male to female and female to male. The reason why the hadith makes mention of one is obviously for reasons. There are reasons I've mentioned some of them. It doesn't mean the other is not included. Then, the same narration continues. Like I said, such a person deserves a VIP status. You have held back something that was really, you were able to do. Your whole body wanted it. Your mind wanted it. Your heart wanted it. There was nothing stopping you. And you just said, you know what? I can't do this. I just can't do this. I fear Allah. You deserve the VIP status on the Day of Judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Then the narration continues and the Prophet sallallahu says, Rajulun tasaddaqa bi sadaqatin faakhfaha hatta la ta'lama shimaluhu ma tunfiqu yaminuhu. A person who spends in the cause of Allah. They are charitable. They give. And they hide their charity in a way that the left hand does not know what the right hand has given. For them, we will also give them a special shape. Look, it's getting easier, isn't it? We started off with Imam Adil. Shabun nasha fi ibadatillahi ta'ala. Rajulun qalbuhu mu'allakum bil masajid. Rajulani tahabba fi Allah. Ishtama alayhi wa tafarraqa alayhi. Rajulun da'atu imratun. Datu mansabin wa jamal. Faqala inni akhafu Allah. I hope you now know those five categories. The sixth one is becoming easier to give a charity and to be secretive about it. No one knows. Because when you give wealth, you want acknowledgement. It comes naturally sometimes. And sometimes you say, no, 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 I don't want acknowledgement. Please don't tell anyone anything. Okay, okay, fine. But can we mention your name in the vote of thanks? Uh, okay, that's fine. Well, there we are. Vote of thanks. We want to thank. If the vote of thanks came without you saying anything, no problem. But you should have gone out of your way to say, listen, I'm donating 3 million here and I don't even want to know. In fact, you can send someone else to donate the 3 million. Is that okay? Make sure he did it because sometimes in the way, it might disappear. Imagine a person wants to donate a huge amount and you don't even know it was them. And they keep on coming and greeting you and you keep on treating them the way you treat the rest of the Muslimin. This is why do not underestimate who's seated right next to you right now. Including you guys here. Mashallah. They are VIPs in the eyes of Allah who might be sitting right next to you. And you don't know you treat them in a, in, a, in a way, oh, this guy's complexion is darker than mine. This guy looks poorer than mine. Oh, he's smelling of perspiration when I've got the latest boss perfume. So what? That's not the height in the eyes of Allah. This person could be closer to Allah than you can imagine. They are owed a beautiful greeting with a beautiful smile. Even the sisters amongst yourselves. Sometimes there's a lot of arrogance. You see a person of a different nationality. You see a person who might not be exactly like you. No greeting, no salam, no kalam. We went to a proper Islamic talk. Get to know those seated next to you in a beautiful way. Greet, smile, make the people feel good. They will want to come next time because they will say, Wow, we enjoyed ourselves. But you go there and you sit and you move away. Why? Because the person next to you perhaps comes from some other part of the world that you don't consider as highty tighty as yours. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. You are a Muslim. You should be feeling this. Why do we want to become higher than others? For what? Like I said, you don't know who's next to you. Perhaps one day you may need them in this world before the next by the will of Allah. Imagine if there was a huge accident and the person who was sitting right next to you says, Sister, it's you. And you look at them and you think to yourself, Wow, this was the sister I refused to greet. I refused. But she's so kind. She still helped me. She still continued. Now we became friends. Why? Because she helped you. Let it be for the sake of Allah from the beginning. That's what it is. Learn to greet one another. Don't be arrogant. And you know what? If someone is asking you something that you cannot deliver, tell them, I can't deliver this. I cannot deliver this. But let it happen. 
For example, someone says, brother, will you visit me at my home? Look, I can't. I'm so sorry I can't. I love you, but I can't visit you. You know, can you give me please five minutes of your time? You know what? I can give you a, a few seconds because if I could give everyone five minutes, you have to be honest. You have to be open. And if they think about it, they will understand. They will know that yes, there, is, there are limitations. The problem is, and like I've done this in one of the masajid once where I asked them to greet one another, to get to know one another, perhaps, you know, the brothers to exchange uh, details of what you're doing and so on. And one of them came back to me and said, please, Sheikh, don't ever do that again. And I said, why? He says, I got so many Muslims coming to my business now that they know what I'm doing, begging for discounts. It's embarrassing me, man. Is that what we said get to know each other for? Don't just look at your own benefit. I'm there and I ask you, brother, where do you work? I'm the CEO of this company. Oh, Allah sent you here, man. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. They won't come next time because they're going to think to themselves, you know, I'm sure there are really important people sitting in our midst quietly. I'm convinced they are. Even among the sisters, I'm convinced there are really important people seated around. You all are important, but perhaps some people who have gone out of their way to be here, I acknowledge that. May Allah bless you. May Allah grant you the best of this world and the next. This is what makes the ummah. People don't know that what you've done in order to be here, for example. Subhanallah. This is why we say, when you give, when you do, you don't have to brag about it. I tell you, there was someone who did something for me, for me. And every time he reminds me, he says, you know what, don't forget, I did this, I did that. I tell him, you know what, brother, I'll calculate the amount and I'll give it back to you. What do you mean? I said, I don't want you to talk about that. And to be honest, later on, I actually took that amount and gave it to a charity and told him, listen, your amount, I've given it to the charity. I'm telling you about my own example. And I did it in a nice way because it became too much. You want to do something for someone, do it for the sake of Allah, not to get, you know, to brag about it for the rest of your life. You know, remember, you're here because of me. Remember that. What are you talking about? It's Allah. Yes, I might acknowledge. I'm not saying don't thank people. No, thank them. But the giver is who we are speaking about today. The giver should be a one who does not want to clock mileage out of his giving besides the pleasure of Allah. No mileage at all. You don't know. I was at a Quran competition in Johannesburg some time back and someone who was watching from overseas happened to say that you know what I want to donate an umrah for a person who wins and so much and so much for all these and an extra amount of cash for all these people who is it? Anonymous who's this anonymous sister? it's good sometimes to say brother or sister because sisters can also be encouraged anonymous sister donating huge amounts who is she? no one has a clue well one or two people might know who might be you know, have collected the thing. She doesn't want to clock mileage. She did it from one part of the world to people in another part of the world whom she probably will never ever meet. But it was for the sake of Allah. This is just an example. Are you ready? You build an institution and you don't say, it's my institute. You build a masjid, you don't say, my mosque. I put the money. No, it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So you want a special status, you've got to fight. That human desire of wanting to be known as a big boss. Subhanallah. I've known some really, really important people who have taught me some huge lessons. I knew a sheikh called a sheikh Saleh al Hussein, rahmatullahi alayhi, he passed away. He was responsible of the Haramain, he was the head of the Haramain. Ra'is Shun al Haramain, Makkah and Medina. He wore slippers worth 10 riyals. He never had a car. He used to catch a taxi. And you wouldn't even guess it was him. Yes, when he had to rise to the occasion, he did. But I asked him personally, why don't you have a car? He says, yeah, waladi. You know, he spoke in Arabic saying, you know, my son, if I have a car, I need to worry about parking. I need to worry about this. I need to worry about that. There's so many things on my head. I, you jump anywhere. My street has so many taxis. I jump in 10 riyal, 20 riyal. I'm where I want to be. And I don't need to worry. I just jump out and I'm there. And I'm thinking, wow. We all want cars. We want a vehicle. I just earned my first few thousand. First thing, Kia, the cheapest car. Allahu Akbar. Sorry, I, I, no offense to those who work for Kia or who might be there. It's a lovely car actually. Although I've never driven one or never driven in one. But I'm sure it's okay. At least a lot of people do. 
But the point I'm raising is something else. It's to show simplicity. The man taught me a lesson. And I'm talking about him because he's passed away. Allah give him Jannah. He won the King Faisal Award. Wow. He won so many awards in his life. Humble man. Sheikh Saleh al Hussein. Those of you who might know a little bit of Arabic, go and Google. Check some of his clips. Look at the simplicity of the man. You won't believe that he was a minister at one stage in Saudi Arabia. And later on, he became Shu'un Ra'is Shu'un al Haramain. He was the one who selected a lot of the Imams or part of the procedure or the process. Powerful man, but he was humble. Some of us don't even have one tenth or one twentieth of a position of some of those people. And we want to lead a life full of extravagance, bigger than anyone else. We will hire vehicles to make like we're the biggest bosses. Because you know why they say in Dubai, it's who you are. You got to pretend to be who you are not in order to be said hello to. Oh, come on. What type of a trend is that? I hope that's not true. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May He strengthen us. Give things for the sake of Allah. Give things without wanting to be known. So this is the hadith. And the hadith beautifully makes mention of the hands here. That the left hand does not know what the right hand will spend. And one of the reasons is it is a sunnah to use the right hand to do good things. So when you're giving a donation, try to give. Even if it's a little person on the street or some box you're putting it into, try to use that right hand to put it in. And we would have derived that even from this beautiful hadith among many other narrations of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The last one is probably one where we all become hopeful. We roar into life once again of mercy. You know, we mentioned all these people who are going to get a special place on the Day of Judgment, right? And sometimes we might still be feeling, oh yeah, I wonder if I'm going to fall into one of these categories. I wonder if I'm going to fall into one of these categories. But I tell you, the last one will make us all think, inshallah, we will. Inshallah, we will. What's the last one? Rajulun dhakar Allah khaliyan fafadat aina. A man and a woman is included in it. You know, the Arabic language, obviously, there's something known as taghlib. Sometimes one is made mention of which includes the other. It's, it's linguistic. I'm not going to go into it, but it includes a female. A man or a woman who remembers Allah all alone and their eyes are filled with tears. Subhanallah. Doesn't it happen to you and I sometimes? We sit and we're thinking of Allah. We're thinking of something and the greatness of Allah, what Allah has done, or even just the tests of Allah. And so much, and suddenly we're just crying. Crying to who? Just my tears just came in because of Allah. I'm just crying. Allah is so merciful, so great. Allah has kept us going. Oh, Allah is testing me with so much. Allahu Akbar. And we're crying. These tears are loved by Allah. Really loved by Allah. A person who's committed sin, for example, and... Suddenly, somehow, they just cry to Allah. Sometimes they burst out. The hadith doesn't even speak about the tear dropping down. It says your eyes were filled with the tears. A person whose eyes were filled with the tears. Or perhaps overflowed with the tears. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How beautiful a gift. Thank Allah, my beloved brothers and sisters. We've indeed had... A lot that we've spoken about this evening. I'm sure we fit in somewhere. And I'm sure we've learned a lot of lessons. I hope and I pray that each one of us can develop to become better people this evening. Promise yourself. I, will, I promise myself that I will try my best to be a better person from now. And I usually say, don't say from tomorrow morning, from the new year, from here. That's all a waste of time. Say from now, everything will change by the will of Allah. My brothers and sisters, it's been an honor to be speaking to you this evening and I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time I actually just spoke until I completed whatever I wanted to say and at the same time the weather's been absolutely awesome don't you agree? Alhamdulillah so to get this type of natural air condition is quite rare in this part of the world except in this season so let's make the most of it inshallah we hope to see you all again tomorrow if allah wills until then wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallah bihamdi subhanakallahumma bihamdi kanashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk